Well, trigger warning, trigger warning, viewers, you've entered a very unsafe space here. This is Mark Latham's Outsiders, where Australia's most politically incorrect news and current affairs show. There's no one out the back with a clipboard with a long list of things I can't say. We try and give you the straight opinion. So many people tell me they're very, very sceptical these days about the information they're getting from the mainstream media. So what they want is an alternative point of view that has no political correctness, no social engineering, no identity politics, and that's what Mark Latham's Outsiders is all about. If you can support us, we really appreciate that. We've got a support page, support.marklathamsoutsiders.com. Get that up on the screen so you can just have a look at the place you go to kick the can and try and ensure that our format, our platform, our show continues week after week. And we've also got a website where you can see all manner of material, the outsider stuff, all anti-PC, all straight shooting, and that's marklathamsoutsiders.com. Uh, we've made a pretty good start. We've got some more news coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, an exciting development of this particular platform. Alternative media is on the march around the world. We want to get it going uh, full throttle here in Australia. We've got a very good show for you coming up this evening. In the background, we've got the Penrith Lees Club in Western Sydney, one of the great outsiders watering holes. Had the odd shandy up there myself over the years. So uh, hello to all the good people in Penrith. We love the outsiders. And we also love the lineup we've got on the program this evening. Later on, we've got Caleb Bond and Kaiser Trad to debate a whole bunch of issues about uh, the um, modernisation, the reform of Islam, some of the stuff about Margaret Court and, and the demonisation of the tennis champion because she's speaking out in favour of believing in God and the law of the land, traditional man-woman marriage. And towards the end of the show, Bettina Arndt, one of our regulars, is coming in to talk about the Men's Rights Conference two weekends from now on the Gold Coast and a very exciting Mark Latham's Outsiders next Tuesday evening when she'll be here, Bettina Arndt, with Karen Strawn one of the remarkable women in the United States who stands up for men's rights. They're going to have a Q&A session here. I think the point is that the ABC, naturally, wouldn't put a sensible woman like Karen Strawn on. She couldn't get on Q&A on the Monday night. So alternative media will be doing it here. Bettina will be doing it with um, uh, uh, Karen Strawn, a Q&A session, inviting your questions. We'll have more news about that on the Facebook page in the coming six days. So look out for that. Uh, but at the top of the show, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Corey Bernardi, the Senator from South Australia, uh, forming the Australian Conservatives Party. Now, what I want to start with, Corey, is how you felt on budget night, when it became so clear that your old party, the Liberals, were in fact labour light, deficit, debt, tax and spend. You must have surely thought to yourself, wow, I made the right decision to break away on my own. Well, I never doubted I made the right decision, Mark, but... Um, I was disappointed, disappointed for the country. It seems like they've uh, put up the white flag and said, we're giving up on debt and deficit. We're going to be tax and spend. I think the country deserves better than that, and I know our children do. What's happened to the modern Liberal Party that this could happen? I, I, you know, I obviously come from a Labor background, joined the Liberal Democrats in recent times, but so many people come up to me and say they can't quite believe that Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten are basically ident identical. And that Liberal Party promise, and it was a promise, to get the budget back into surplus has now been forgotten and it looks like we'll have permanent debt and deficit, what, for the next five or six years at least? Oh, it's going to be more than five or six years. Right. I mean, the, the entire projections of the budget are fanciful. There's no way there's going to be a $7 billion surplus in 2021. The, the national debt's projected to get $725 billion by 2025. Um, so we've lost control of the budget uh, outcome. I think the Liberal Party surrendered economic management um, it's become like what Riccio had in the Labor Party, whatever it takes. I remember reading that book. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter about the outcomes. Let's protect our jobs. And I remember once in the party room when we were debating the emissions trading scheme. And I stood up and said, this is not in the national interest. We've got to do something better. And, uh, and one of my colleagues stood up and said, I don't give a fig about the national interest. I just want this to go away so I can get re-elected. And that, to me, said everything that's wrong with modern politics. Well, it's the machine influence. It's true that the Labor Party in the 80s and 90s was overrun by machine politics, where basically if an interest group walks in the door, left feminists, ethnic group, pro-migration group, uh, Greens walk in the door, the machine politician says, yeah, I'll, I'll accommodate your policy agenda uh, if, if there are votes in it for me. Yep. If your uh, people vote for us, we'll support your policy. Now, it seems to me the Labor Party was overrun by machine politics in the 80s and 90s. It seems more recently, particularly here in New South Wales with the influence of Michael Fotios, 
the Liberals have been overrun by machine politics. So the same interest groups are walking in the door to the Labor and the Liberal yep. factional leaders and they're getting the same response. Yeah, we'll back you. You're exactly right. And, and you're seeing the influence of lobbyists. And now mm. lobbyists are transactional and politics is becoming transactional. You do this for me and I'll do, do that for you. Uh, and it's with the self-interest groups or the motivated groups or the identity politics, that's what's happening. And if nothing else, my success, if it's success, has been relationship-based. For 10 years, I've been speaking to people every single week, trying to respond to their emails uh, via my blog site, via my outreach. And so people think they know me uh, mm. because they do. You know, I am what I never pretend to be something else. And so I've always thought we're much better investing in a relationship than in a transaction. And that's what I think has damaged modern politics today because it's all transactions. So you see the Australian Conservatives then as very much values and policy based. Yep. And you're deliberately going to keep lobbyists at arm's length and not have any of these special interests uh, well, overrunning your position. It's, it's, we're going to make every decision built around principles. Is mm -hmm. it good for families? Mm -hmm. Is it going to limit government? Is it about personal responsibility? And is it good for civil society? Now, civil society is one of those things that's about protecting and defending the institutions that are there. Some of these four principles are interrelated. You know, I'm absolutely pro-market, I'm pro-business, I think that's really important, but I also think there is a, you know, a moral obligation mm -hmm. we have to our fellow citizens. And um, so with the Liberal Democrats, for example, on the economic issues, I'm with them all the time. Mm -hmm. we're, and the social issues, you know, we're slightly different because we're, we're approaching things in a different way. But I make no apologies for that. Um, I'm going to assess everything that's put to me and ask myself the question, does it fit within that box? Mm. Does it fit within the framework that the Australian Conservatives believe in? And we can make informed judgments, and it means we won't just fall for any smoke and mirrors routine that's brought about by, uh, you know, the pressure groups, whether it be about mm -hmm. Indigenous recognition or about same-sex marriage or it be about something else, you know? Well, on that, what did you think of Noel Pearson's plan for what amounts to a shadow parliament? I was there in 2004 as opposition leader when uh, I put forward the proposal to get rid of ATSI the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Commission, which was uh, stale, rorted, expensive and ineffective. And John Howard agreed. We got rid of ATSIC. And it seems to me remarkable that Pearson is trying to write a version of ATSIC, an elected body, so-called uh, advisory body or a, sh a shadow parliament, to write all the sins of ATSIC into the Australian Constitution. This is crazy, isn't it? I, I think the whole thing is designed to fail, actually, Mark. I, I can't help that. I think the Australian people maybe would have worn some symbolic statement of fact, you know, that there were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here beforehand. Uh -huh. Now, I'm not signing up to that, but I'm saying I think the Australian people would have worn that. They will not wear a nation within a nation. They will not wear a parallel parliament or a third chamber in the parliament. They're sick to death of people blaming us and calling people like you and me a racist because we're going, what are we doing? We're throwing 30 or $40 billion a year into helping Aboriginal disadvantage, and what have we got to show for it? Not much at all. And I reckon people are heartily sick of it. Uh, you know, I saw this bloke on Q&A on Monday night, first bloke that stood up, and he said, you know, he was proud to be a black fella. He was whiter than you or me. Was he right? I just, it was just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So uh, why then hasn't Malcolm Turnbull knocked this on the head straight away? Because I'd imagine this proposal would have maybe 20, at most 30% support in the, in the, in the states? Uh, if, so it's, if, it's, that. if that, if that. Yeah. Why would Turnbull allow this to run, given the fact that your average Australian would see it as a form of legal separatism, putting us into two-nation category? I, I don't know, but I'm going to presuppose that, that Malcolm Turnbull is conflicted. You know, on one hand, his natural instinct is that he's a, a left person. You know, he, he is a left-leaning liberal at best, um, but he knows that he leads a, what should be a mainstream centre-right conservative party. It's no longer a conservative party, and I don't think they know whether they're mm. Arthur or Martha anymore. Mm. And so that's why, if you're a Liberal, you go to the, you know, the Liberal Democrats, for example, if you're a Conservative, the Australian Conservatives are the answer for you, because that's where you know, you're going to have some, uh, some common sense policies, I think. Yeah, no, well, Australians are certainly calling out for common sense. There's no doubt about that. And they're very disappointed with the mainstream parties. But on another issue to do with interest groups, uh, immigration. Yep. Uh, we've had a big debate about housing affordability. It seems to me that the unspoken truth is that if you turn off the tap or reduce the flow of immigration, 
you reduce the demand for housing in Australia and take the pressure off prices. That's a, an economic truth and, again, common sense. The other thing about uh, our big Australia immigration program, the biggest in the world per capita, is that it's adding to urban sprawl. Where yep. I live in the outer fringe of Western Sydney, the, the, the suburbs are becoming dysfunctional, just the huge pressure of people moving in. And, and the infrastructure thing they talk about, you can spend 10 times as much as they're spending now and still not keep up with the growth of the new suburbs and provide proper access to opportunities and, and, and jobs for the people living there. And the third factor, there's some research showing that uh, big immigration puts downward pressure on wages in Australia. Uh, if skilled migration comes in, there's naturally a pressure in competing against existing um, um, workers and the uh, downward pressure on real wages may be a, a reason why we've had so much wage, sta wage stagnation in Australia over the last five or six years. Now, Judith Sloan wrote an excellent piece about this in the Australian newspaper yesterday and she concluded, if I can quote Judith Sloan, if the government really had wanted to demonstrate its determination to improve housing affordability and the related pressure on urban infrastructure, it would have slashed the migration numbers, but clearly it was too hard. The vested yeah. interests have had their way. Is this another example of the Liberal Party run over the top by vested interests? Judith Sloan is right and so are you. Uh, governments love big migration because what it does is you've got more people consuming more products so GDP grows and they can say we've avoided a recession, look our economy is doing well. But the Productivity Commission said itself immigration is putting pressure on housing prices. We've got Commonwealth Bank research that said immigration is far too high at the moment because per capita, mm. when it comes down and you break it down to the individual income per household or per, per individual, the migration levels now are far too high and people are going backwards for the same reasons that you said. Housing costs, infrastructure costs, welfare costs, and they're not seeing the benefits themselves. So mm -hmm. our policy, mm -hmm. halve migration, let's make sure that you know, our standards are lifted so we've got people that are coming here to be part of the team, that are going to make us stronger, make our country better, uh, rather than get in there and uh, you know, live off the system. So you bring the program down from its current level, Judith Sloan said that they didn't highlight this in the budget papers, mm. but it stayed around 200,000 yep. a year immigration. You bring that down to 100,000. 100. And what would you do with the refugee program that comes on top of the family reunion and skilled uh, well, labour? Well, this is the thing. I think the refugee program is flawed because we can't you know, filter and screen all the people appropriately, and that's demonstrated, notwithstanding what the chap from ASIO said the other day, mm. but that's flawed. We've got to make sure that uh, family reunion visas, I think, need to go. And I tell you this because mm -hmm. your family, you don't just suddenly find a family once you've arrived in Australia. You know when you're applying for a visa that you've got a mum and a dad and three sisters and six cousins or whatever you want to bring out. So make them all apply under the same visa. That's the common sense thing to me. You say at the same time, Mark Latham, if you want to migrate here, well, put your mum and your, all your siblings on there or your wife or anyone else and apply at the same time. That's what my wife did with right. her family. And secondly, I would say we've got to stop the rorting of the visa programs, and it's rorted in three ways. One is in-country visa processing is being manipulated in high-risk countries. If you're a Coptic Christian and you go to the Egyptian, uh, you know, the Australian embassy in Egypt and it's staffed by local Muslims, you've got zero chance of getting a visa to come out here because they just slip it down to the bottom of the pile. Secondly. Um, if people are coming out here on student visas or you know, on a temporary working permit or something like that, I figure at the end of that time they should go back to their own country and if they want to apply again under a different circumstance, that's entirely right. And thirdly, I would pull out entirely of the uh, UNHCR um, you know, with that uh, compulsory refugee settlement. There's no way in the world the United Nations should be making one single determination about who we allow into this country or how they get here. Yeah, well, on the category of people coming to Australia and the nations they're coming from, traditionally we've had a fairly benign attitude towards Indonesia. But I just want to play for Corey and the viewers the uh, news clip of the terrible news out of Aceh last week of the 83 lashes administered to two men um, supposedly guilty of of gay sex in Indonesia. The country's becoming more radical all the time. It's a major uh, Islamic country, the biggest in the world, of course. So let's look at the news clip of what happened there last week. Indonesian religious police in Banda Aceh, Sumatra, caned two men for gay sex on Tuesday with hooded men inflicting 82 lashes on each of them. 
Up to 1,000 people, many filming with smartphones, watched as the two men received the lashes on the race platform at the mosque. Many others watched the punishment being meted out on the live stream video. Setelah terpidana itu dihukum ya, ataupun dieksekusi, mereka akan dikembalikan pada pihak keluarga. Karena ini kasih pada sanksi sosial. Jadi mudah-mudahan dengan diberikan sanksi seperti ini di muka umum, selain dia juga masyarakat juga bisa apa namanya berempati ataupun tidak tidak lagi melakukan perbuatan-perbuatan yang dilanggar oleh pelanggar tersebut. The two men were helped off the platform after the caning and were free to return to their families. Ini adalah suatu hukum positif yang apa outputnya yang harapan kita semua untuk bisa menjadi pelajaran supaya jangan ada lagi yang melanggar syariat. The punishment condemned by rights groups marked the first application of anti-homosexuality laws introduced in the province in 2014. Aceh has long had a reputation as Indonesia's most conservative region. Well, Corey Bernardi, how worried are you about that and the general trend in Indonesia? It's not just what we saw there, but the news that the governor of uh, Jakarta has been uh, convicted of so-called blasphemy crimes that most Australians would regard as just a reasonable form of free speech. So are you worried about uh, our nearest neighbour there and uh, do you support Darren Hinch's call to cut foreign aid to Indonesia until they smarten themselves up? Well, the first point of that is um, I'm really worried about it. I mean, we've been told for years that Indonesia is a secular Muslim country and there's nothing to worry about there. But we know when extremism and Sharia gets a hold, it subsumes everything else over the period of time. And it forces people into compliance by intimidation, bullying and the threat of or risk of being called a bad Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, and so we should be worried about what's happening in Aceh and what's happening in Jakarta. Um, I think that there is a real problem when we're sent borrowing money to send to Indonesia so they can spend it on jets and various other things or freeze up their own money to spend on, on jets and not to counter this sort of thing. We've got a real problem. I think our aid budget needs to be completely reviewed and looking about how it's you know, going to be best used and sometimes that best use can be here at home because we've got plenty of problems here. Well, on that subject, the problems here, uh, we've uh, had discussions on this program about youth radicalisation. We had a very brave teacher from Western Sydney, Mrs A, who uh, gave the account of how she'd been intimidated, uh, students at Punchbowl Primary doing, these were primary school mm. students, you know, 11, 12 years old, sl uh, slitting the throat motion, uh, bailing her up, um, um, chanting the Quran at her in Arabic. Uh, the radicalisation in the school seems to be swept under the carpet by some of the authorities. What's your policy for dealing with this problem and how do we defend our civilization? Firstly, I want to make the point. It's not just you know, Islamic school students that are out of control. You know, there seems to be too many kids today that have no boundaries put upon them. You can't say this is right or this is wrong. There is no respect or very little respect for authority. Parents are washing their hands of the responsibility of raising their children and society is reaping the product of that. The state has been having to step in again and again and again, and the left are telling us there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. I think there is. I think responsibility starts at home, and until we make parents accountable, there's going to be a problem. But when it comes to defending our culture, defending our values, I think we've got to have a zero tolerance thing. I just don't buy this multiculturalism thing that all cultures are equal and they can all coexist together. Self-evidently, that's not right. If it was, why would people want to come to Australia and to experience and enjoy our culture and flee the Middle East or anywhere else? It's because it's better here. And so what we need to do is to make sure that people subscribe to our values. We need to reinforce them at every turn and governments need to stop turning a blind eye to these you know, Islamic schools where they're segregating boys and girls and you've got uh, senior principals saying girls aren't allowed to play sport because it will cause them to lose their virginity. And you've got, you know, one of your later guests tonight justifying beating of wives or anything else. And no matter how it's dressed up, these things are abominations and they've got no place here. And yet every time you go in and you start finding some facts or you find out about, you know, some of the terrible things that are going on, there's a group of people who will wade into it and go, Mark Latham, you're a racist or you're a bigot or you're an Islamophobe or you're a whatever it is because you've belled the cat and told them the truth. Yeah, but in our institutions, it. there seems to be a problem that um, there's a, a soft accommodating attitude that uh, in the case of Mrs A, 
She was obviously badly treated by the students. She raised it with mm. the school principal who said, you need to harden up. That's the way these kids are. Let's just uh, get on with it. So the zero tolerance is not being practiced in our schools. Yeah, you're right. Which is a, a massive problem. And I would have thought we're making the situation worse for ourselves. Like, I mean, if you're a, a disaffected uh, young Islamic kid in, in, in Western Sydney around Punchbowl, mm. Akemba, those sorts of places, and you're being taught safe schools, respectful relationships that that we're a society of, of uh, wife beaters, that, that men are demonised, there's a thing called white male privilege, that um, uh, we're a bigoted nation, we're a racist nation. I mean, all the messages that come out of publicly funded organisations like universities, schools, the ABC, SBS, most parts of the federal parliament, are actually denigrating Western culture. Yeah. Doesn't this play into the hands of radicalisation? Because the young person is inclined to think, well, if they don't support and believe in their own culture, why should I? I'll absorb the message of Islamic State and get stuck into them. But this is the counterculture movement that's crept through the left right around the world, starting with Gramsci. It's about find mm -hmm. victims, undermine your own culture, replace it with something that is, you know, statist. And uh, so if you've got groups that have a, a relatively homogenous, if you will, you know, the Islamic community tends to stick together a lot and they rely on each other and they're bound by faith and, and, and their own values in many respects, then that's what they're going to cling to. And we can't do that anymore. We've got to say, no, there are good things about this country that we're going to defend and we want you to be part of it as well. Well, where do we do that? How do we do that in our institutions? Should we make university funding conditional on support for Western civilization? We ah. don't tolerate, we don't tolerate uh, cultural Marxism uh, in, in the university sector. Do we write support for Western civilization into the charter of the ABC? Do we start teaching more courses about Western civilization and its virtues? Well, because at the moment you'd have to say for that young radical disaffected in a place like Punchbowl that Australian society doesn't seem proud of its cultural heritage and if we're not proud why should he be? Well, nothing you put in the ABC charter is going to make a difference. I think the existing charter proves that. When it comes to universities and higher education though, I think there needs to be some accountability for them. Right mm -hmm. now they are only interested in getting people into their courses and graduating them whether they're going to be equipped for jobs or not. You know, so you can have the sexuality courses and the this and the basket weaving courses and all those sorts of things. The students walk out with ten, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars worth of debt and the university doesn't care. At the moment, or in the next few years, we're expected to have eighty five billion dollars, I think, of student debt uh -huh. and something like thirty billion of it is never going to be repaid. Right? And these people are not going to be able to get meaningful jobs. So put it back on the universities. Say, if you're not going to equip your graduates for meaningful employment, if they haven't got a job after five years, you're going to start paying their hex interest right. accounts okay. or something like that. You watch them sharpen up and stop the basket weaving courses. Fund them for results. And yes, yeah, stop undermining Western civilization and Western culture with all their BS that they're importing from all these places all over the, uh, the world mm. and start getting into the mainstream of what academics is meant to do. Equip mm. people with skills that are going to derive a valuable income for mm. them. Well, I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. You're watching Mark Latham's mm. Outsiders. I'm here with Corey Bernardi. Uh, I want to thank Corey for his uh, participation in the show. I think his party is providing a, a viable alternative to the Labor-Liberal uh, alliance, if you like. Uh, Liberals have become Labor light and Labor's drifted off to being much closer to the Greens. So we need more alternatives. Here at Mark Latham's Outsiders, we support outsider parties that are bucking the trend and standing up to the two major parties and ending their oligopoly. So uh, I want to thank Corey. I also want to um, use... Um, our changeover of guests, just to play a video, Ben Fordham on 2GB, to his credit, has highlighted one of the problems, an amazing problem in the Australian Defence Force, where they've hired an Imam, Imam Salim, who in the past has given comfort to Hizbut Tahir, that radical organisation, and this Imam has also spoken in favour of Sharia law through the family court system in Australia. So I don't know what he's doing there in the um, Australian Defence Force, uh, the statistics show, of course, that uh, more Muslims are signing up to fight with Islamic State than actually join the Australian Defence Force in the last couple of years. That's a worry. Ben Fordham's highlighted it. And when we come back after this uh, video clip, we're going to talk to Caleb Bond and uh, Kaisar Trad about this particular problem in the ADF. Thanks, Corey. And uh, we'll be back with our uh, next set of guests after this video clip. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, mate. Let me tell you about Sheikh Mohammed Nawaz Saleem. 
the official imam for the Australian Defence Force. Now, you might be asking, why does the Australian Defence Force need its own imam? Well, the Defence Force believes that this will help attract more Muslims to the Army, the Navy or the Air Force. It was a low-key announcement in September of 2015. The Assistant Minister for Defence, Stuart Robert, today announced the appointment of Imam Muhammad Nawaz Saleem to the Religious Advisory Committee for the Services. They're the armed services. Now, we haven't heard too much from Sheikh Muhammad Nawaz Saleem since his appointment. Today, I've contacted the Defence Force Imam and asked if we can have a chat to him on the radio because I want to ask him where he stands on the radical group Hizbat Tahrir, which has been condemned by every man and his dog in recent years. And it's no wonder when you consider how the world would look if Hizbat Tahrir had its way. This is the group that just two months ago was claiming that under their teachings it was acceptable to murder ex-Muslims. Remember the Australian leader of this mob, Utman Badar, saying that we don't shy away from that fact. That's the appropriate punishment for someone who leaves Islam, death. And this is the same man, Utman Badar, who wanted to deliver a speech to the Sydney Opera House with the title, Honour Killings Are Morally Justified. The same mob that says it's okay to hit your wife, as long as you use a small stick, and the same dangerous elements who refuse to condemn the actions of Islamic State. You might remember another spokesman from Hizbut Tahrir on Late Line with Emma Alberici a few years ago, repeatedly evading questions and refusing to condemn Islamic State terrorists. They've told their followers that Australia's democratic government has to go in favour of an Islamic caliphate ruled by Sharia law. Now, that's the track record of Hizbat Tahrir. Now, with all of that in mind, I want to ask the official imam of the Australian Defence Force if he supports Hizbat Tahrir, because people in the Defence Force community have brought it to my attention that Sheikh Mohammed Nawaz Saleem has shown public support for these lunatics. That's right, the Defence Force imam signed a public petition supporting Hizbat Tahrir. Here it is from 2015. We strongly oppose Prime Minister Tony Abbott's politically convenient threats to tackle and crack down on Islamic groups such as Hizbat Tahrir, who disavow and have never supported terrorist acts, and whose only crime has been to criticise the Abbott government's stance towards Muslims domestically and abroad, as they are well within their rights to do. This petition was signed by Sheikh Mohammed Nawaz Saleem, the Defence Force Imam. So I'd like to know whether he's supported of his Tahrir. This is Mark Latham's Outsiders. I'm joined now by Kaiser Trad and Caleb Bond. Welcome to the program. Thank you very and much. And let's start with Kaiser. Your reaction to uh, this imam uh, serving with the Australian Defence Force there, a paid position. Uh, it's inappropriate, isn't it, that he supported... I, I was a chaplain with the Department of Defence for eight and a half years. Totally unpaid. Uh, I used to... Uh, give briefings to forces to be deployed overseas and uh, my purpose was always to try and uh, help avoid incidents to uh, um, hopefully that our troops would uh, be just peacekeepers and uh, um, come back safely to Australia without any incidents uh, involving any of the locals. Uh, uh, so I did that work for eight and a half years and uh, 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 whilst I don't see myself as controversial, uh, there, has been, there have been some controversies about me. I know the imam in question, I've met him before. Uh, I, am, uh, uh, I am surprised of the statement, uh, of his statement uh, with respect to Hizbut Tahrir. Uh, most people would know that there's no love lost between me and that group. In fact, uh, that group is openly critical of, of me and my work. Uh, um, but uh, be that as, as, as it may, um, I don't believe that the group itself calls for violence uh, and I don't believe that the group should be given uh, uh, the, the um, attention and publicity that they are given. But haven't, haven't they argued um, or they failed to condemn the foreign fighters going to join ISIS and uh, they're a known radical group uh, banned I, in some other parts of the world? Uh, why can't they be more mainstream and uh, have this imam in the defence force? It's a very bad sign, isn't it? Look, I'm, not a, I'm not an apologist for either of them. Right. Uh, I, I could understand the psychology behind what they say and the reason that they say it. What, uh, what is in, the psychology? In my humble opinion, uh, most of that psychology is a recruitment drive because uh, it appeals to uh, the, those young people on the margins and uh, um, it gives them somewhere or some group to, uh, that they might be able to um, 
uh, go and listen to and uh, find something that uh, appeals to their way of thinking or some explanation for their feelings of marginalisation. Personally, I prefer to uh, uh, make young people feel included, to do everything that we can to bring everybody in the community, make them feel included, make them feel part of Australian society, make them feel that they can contribute constructively to Australian well, I'm society. I'm glad to hear you say that, but isn't the evidence that Hizbut Tahir is really playing on marginalisation instead of bringing people into the mainstream? They're fostering the feeling of discontent and that can only add to radicalisation. Well, look, uh, uh, again, I'm not an apologist for the group. And, uh, How about condemning I, them? Uh, I can assure <laughs> you that uh, uh, um, there will be a lot of criticism of what I'm saying with respect to the group. I've been uh, uh, in open arguments with this group since the mid-90s when I used to uh -huh. host a community radio program. Uh -huh. uh, very open arguments. We've had debates about the approaches uh, that they take and the approach that the mainstream community takes. And... Uh, uh, we've always encouraged dialogue and discussion. Uh, you and I might disagree on something, but the mm -hmm. best way to deal with that disagreement is to talk it out. Uh, talk it out and then let the public decide. And uh, uh, over the years, we've had a number of programs. Uh, uh, we've stopped doing them about six years ago. Where that, that involved uh, various groups, including this particular group, where their leaders would come and speak. And the ideas would be debated openly in the community. Uh, uh, the main sponsor of that program is, has passed away since, uh, uh, and uh, I stopped being involved in these programs. But uh, uh, before that, we did these programs, and we did show the community that there are different ideas, and the best way to deal with ideas that might be uh, held by a small group, that may be, that, that may be uh, not uh, ideas that fit with the mainstream, is to discuss them well, and refute them Well, discussion, though, in, in these troubled times may well be inadequate. You need to condemn organisations like Hizbut Tahir, what they stand for, the ideas they're propagating, and to uh, ensure that someone who's an imam in the Australian Defence Force is not representative of those radical ideas. Caleb Bond, let me bring you in. Let me say congratulations on your emerging career in the media. Uh, Caleb is an amazing uh, progeny of the, the media because he's uh, 17 years of age. Uh, I often say at 17, who knew what was going on? But Caleb writes effectively for the Daily Telegraph and has got a cadetship there working out of South Australia with News Corp. So how do you see this uh, discussion that we're having? Look, I think it's troubling to think that there is someone working for the Defence Force who would have those sort of opinions um, and back his Taria. Because you think of the Defence Force, uh, is the outfit that's meant to go out and defend everything that is Australia, our values, our people, everything we stand for. And if you've got someone in there who is effectively um, working for, working with Muslim members of the Australian Defence Force and has those sorts of ideas, it's very troubling, it's very dangerous, and you want someone in there who is, Austra is, is avowedly Australian, that's what you're looking for. Someone who stands up for Australian values, believes in those values. And I'm not entirely sure that someone who stands with Hizbut Tahrir fits that bill. Yeah, well, Kaiser, are you worried that uh, more Muslims have joined ISIS as far as foreign fighters that have actually signed up with the Australian Defence Force? The imam there doesn't seem to be doing a great job if he's trying to recruit Muslims to fight on our side. Uh, many more are fighting uh, on the other side. Look, one Muslim joining ISIS is one Muslim too many, and I'd like to save all Muslims from joining a group of this nature. I've been very, uh, very uh, uh, outspoken in my condemnation of uh, the actions of this group, and I've been very outspoken in discouraging people from going anywhere near this group to the extent that I've received death threats from members of that group on, the, on Twitter, uh, and I referred those threats to the authorities. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not shy to condemn bad action where I see them. Uh, I, uh, as a religious person, I usually fall short of condemning individuals because I believe that as long as an individual lives, lives and breathes, there's hope for their salvation. I reach out and say, let me try and save you. And most people might scoff at my offer. It's up to them. It's up to, uh, what I am required uh, before God is to reach out. Reach out to whether I agree with them or disagree with them. There are some people that are... Uh, very argumentative that you can't really talk to them uh, but you still make the first effort if it doesn't work you just walk away and do something else but uh, uh, where there's room for dialogue I think as long as the door for dialogue is open uh, then there's hope. Well on a more positive subject we're in the fifth day of the month of Ramadan 
and uh, I think it's always good to get an explanation of these uh, religious practices. What, what's that about Ramadan? Well, Ramadan is uh, an entire lunar month uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Muslim calendar and uh, it requires Muslims to abstain from food, from water and from conjugal acts uh, or from any uh, consumption uh, from dawn, which is about an hour and a half before sunrise, all the way until sunset. In winter it's a short day, in summer it's a, obviously a longer day. People in Melbourne have a longer day still because uh, it just happens to be a longer day. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the, we have this abstention from food. It, it allows the body a chance to detoxify. And at the same time, it, uh, it trains the person uh, to uh, have more so, uh, self-control. Uh, you control yourself from, ha from consuming things that you're allowed to during, the, during these hours. Uh, so obviously if you control yourself from having things that are allowed, then you can control yourself from having things that you're not allowed to have as well. Uh, and it's a period where uh, you give uh, supremacy of the soul over the body, the spirit. The, you nurture the spirit with extra prayers and uh, uh, every night there are many extra prayers. Is there any evidence that achieves a great deal? I, I know you can say that of a lot of religious practices, but in the community, uh, does it bring people together in a more peaceful, harmonious way? Oh, look, it definitely brings people together. There's no shortage of community groups having a communal iftar every night. Or uh -huh. Iftar means breaking of the fast. So every night, even the, I think tomorrow night the New South Wales Premier is having a, 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 a breaking of the fast oh, meal like for Malcolm the community. Malcolm Turnbull uh, like last Malcolm year in the Malcolm election campaign. That's right. We all remember that. <laughs> that's right. And Malcolm Turnbull <laughs> undermined his good work by criticising... Shake Shady the, was there. That's right. Shake Shady was there yeah, and disgraced right. the whole event, really. Well, he criticised uh, uh, Sheikh Shady happens to be the head of the Imams Council at the moment and uh, uh, whether people like him or not the position that he has is a very important position in the community uh, it's a national position it's, uh, uh, he is meant to be the, the president of uh, the uh, spiritual leaders of the Muslim community so uh, uh, he was criticised for some comments that he made about homosexuality and women yeah. uh, and uh, the the um, what, what was really, uh, um, I suppose, uh, ungracious of the Prime Minister at that time was that he was your guest. And uh, it's an Australian value, it's a Muslim value, it's a universal human value that uh, you don't go and criticise your guests like this after you've invited them to, your, to, to have a meal with you. But uh, I think but the point was Turnbull, did, Kyle, come in. Yeah, no, but didn't, I, I, Turnbull didn't know of Sheikh Shady's views. Wasn't that the point, that he got into the event? And once he found out, I think it's fair with, enough that he condemns with, them, with, with, with all due respect, he was the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister has a huge number of staff who do research on every single person that they invite to a gathering. Prime Ministers don't just invite people just off the cuff. They do... They check the people out. They well, know they say they didn't know, and uh, well, the they news once known. known had to be mm. condemned. They couldn't... You couldn't have a situation where someone who'd said, that effectively, women can rot in hell, and and, and, and homosexuals should be uh, done in, uh, is breaking bread with the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister doesn't condemn those views. He should have checked beforehand. Well, he oh, should have. But, but, but if those are the views of the head of the Imams Council, what does that say about what the Imams Council believes? Look, I, I, I'm not a member of the Imams Council. I'm not a qualified Imam. I'm, I'm a, uh, You're a not volunteer. a friend of Sheikh Shady either, uh, are you? I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy look, to say. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't say that I'm not a friend. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, I have good terms with many people in the community. And uh, um, Come on, guys. I know sitting on the uh, fence here. This I is Mark Latham's <laughs> outsider. Uh, We're straight shooters. We don't have splinters in our backside. You've got to take a, yeah. you've got to take a position. Uh, Sheikh Shay does a lot of good work for young, with young people. Oh. A lot of good work he has done with young people. He's, uh, some of his views may have been as poorly expressed as some of my uh, comments in the past. I've made comments that uh, I've realised that maybe it's because English is my third language or maybe because uh, uh, the eloquence of divine discourse is, is not that easy to translate into, into English for someone uh, with my limited skills. Uh, that uh, uh, at the end of a long day being clumsy, I, I've made comments that... Yeah, we remember that, the Bolt Report and Domestic Bolt, Violence, and right. you did... Uh, apologise and withdraw your comments and clarify them, so Look, that was to uh, your credit. Uh, We've got to move on here at Mark Latham's Outsiders to another controversy. Auburn Swimming Pool and the petitioning or the curtaining off of the area for the benefit of uh, Muslim women. We raised this last week. Let's have a look at the clip from A Current Affair and we'll get a response from our panel. Who would have thought this tiny pool behind these big curtains? Where should curtains be used in normal day life? On your window to stop people perving at you when you've got no gear on. Not in a public swimming pool. 
could create such a tidal wave of emotion. What a load of crap. And I think this is a shame. I think it's for the whole community. It's, um, it's a local community pool. At your local pool, you'd expect to find curtains in your changing rooms, right? But here, they've been put up around the entire pool, effectively segregating it from the rest of the aquatic centre, mainly to accommodate female Muslim swimmers. And as you'd expect, that's created more than a few waves. Well, Caleb, this is just plain wrong, isn't it? Absolutely. It's not multiculturalism, it's segregation. It is indeed. And once you start down the road of segregation, you are on a very, very dangerous track. As you say, integration and assimilation um, and multiculturalism in those terms is exactly what we want. But if you've got to separate people along those lines, whether it be religious or ethno-cultural or whatever it is, uh, you go down a very dangerous track. Just look at South Africa. If, if the leaders of apartheid South Africa knew this sort of thing was going on, they'd love it. Well, Kaiser, how do you see it? Isn't it the individual responsibility of the women worried about the modesty issues to wear a burkini? Look, Why has the area got to be segregated often? And, 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 and non-Muslim men, they pay their rates, they pay to get in. Shouldn't they have entire use of the facility? Look, firstly, this is a very limited form of segregation, a very, very limited form. It's not... Uh, uh, um, universal segregation where you, you see it out in the street, you, see it, you don't see it in the shop. It's a public city, you don't see it in the it's, restaurant. It's a public facility. You see it in a limited place where uh, women are given the freedom to dress as they choose, where no males can see them. Um, this gives these women access to a swimming pool and access to swimming classes and access to be able to enjoy what swimming is all about. Without this, this is what we've got to think about. What about, about. the bikini? Why can't they wear a bikini? Some of them do. Some of them do wear the burkini on the, even on the beach. Well, why not here? Uh, why not here? So they're, they're, uh, I'm certain that there's a number of, of them who feel that the burkini is not adequate enough. Uh, uh, the uh, um, whole idea of, of the uh, um, modest dress is that uh, uh, it is not only covering the body, but also does not accentuate the various curves in the body. Uh, it's part of modesty, and uh, if, if you cast your mind back uh, to maybe uh, the turn of the, the previous century, uh, women in Western society used to have their own special areas to swim in. Uh, I remember seeing old pictures where they, they would not... Well, we got over that because yeah. we became a pluralistic, uh, more open society. Why is it wrong for a man to view female flesh at the beach or at the swimming pool? Why does the Quran teach this when... It'd be wrong for a man to act the wrong way, but surely viewing something uh, in a tolerant society is not a bad thing. Well, it's all about modesty. The rules of modesty uh, in Islam... Uh, it's outdated, uh, isn't it? Uh, it's rules, outdated. The, the issue with the rules of modesty is I think it's inherently sexist, and that is the issue. It's essentially mm. saying that uh, if a woman is not covered up, you know, men are going to look at her, that's a terrible thing. Why is it a terrible thing? Well, look, thing? men are supposed to cover up as well. Uh, men, uh, you, you don't see me... Uh, uh, wearing, uh, what do they call it, the, uh, the, budget, the budget smugglers. Budget. And that's, and, and nor would I wear them You wouldn't see me wearing them. Nor would I wear them, but when I go down to the beach or I go to the pool, I don't expect a, a, a separate space for me to go to. I'm quite happy to be with, with everyone else, no matter what they're wearing or how they look, because that's just sort of how we operate, isn't it? Look, it, it might be uh, uh, fine for you, but if somebody feels uncomfortable and they like to have their own space, I don't think we should begrudge them, because... Uh, you still have plenty of other space for other people who want to have access yeah, but what to the about I, th I think this practice builds up a lot of resentment mm. against the Islamic community because if you're a, uh, a rate payer, a man, you paid your rates, you paid to get in at the turnstile, you expect use of a public facility. And Australian swimming pools have always been based on that principle. They're open, they're affordable, everyone mixes together. How can we get to know the women on the other side of the curtain, build the trust of a multicultural society if the petition is there? Isn't it against all the principles that's not the of only, Australian egalitarianism? That's not the only place where you can get to know people. This yeah, is but it's one, it's, it's an one. important place. And if you start there, it's, wh it's a symbolic where does it go thing. next? I think that's what it is. I don't think, it's, uh, I don't think this is a start. I think this is uh, uh, just allowing this woman to have access to a, a private swimming space I think women it's have the right. It's a public pool. Uh, I understand. If you did it in a privately own, owned yeah, pool, well, so be it. Pool. But I, this I, is everyone's pool, surely. Ev and the, a significant number of the ratepayers in that particular uh, uh, local government area are Muslim women. A very significant number. And if the significant number of Muslim women in that area 
would like their own private space, I believe that they're entitled no, to it. They wrong. are, they they are amongst wrong. the voters. They having having some rate payers doesn't entitle you to a private space. I'd, I'd in a say public a significant, facility. a very significant. Well, it can be as significant as you like. But if we did that, if if I said white men in my municipality of uh, of um, of Wallandilly are entitled to our own space at a pool because we're the majority of rate payers, that would be wrong. And that would segregate us from other people in a society where we should be mixing together, make friendships, get to know other cultures, you know, build a bit of harmony and understanding. I think, I think you're fouling your own nest with this mm. argument. But you can, do, you can do that without having to see people in a, a swimming costume. And this is the whole point. We well, can't but see anyone. They're behind the petition, behind the curtain. It's not about Caleb. having to see people in a swimming costume. I think it's about the symbolism of segregating people along religious lines. If I go to a public swimming pool, it's, I think, entirely reasonable to expect that it's open to everyone. All of it is open to everyone who wants to go there. It's not about wanting to leer at people or having to see them. It's about being open and respectful and tolerant. What's the difference between that and hiring one of those pools at that particular and centre for a period of time? If, well, if they want to it's hire It's the same it, thing. It's really yeah, the same principle not, that you hire, you hire this particular section of that public pool, which has so many different pools from what I understand, you hire one of those pools on specific days, you have the curtain uh, in, because you're, you're having a private swimming session. Mm -hmm. uh, th there is nothing wrong with that. You go to restaurants where there are private rooms, you go to so many places yeah, where there are private... They're privately owned facilities. It's, uh, wrong, it's wrong at a publicly you, owned facility. You it should belong to everyone. You can but we'll have to move on. We'll have to move on to another controversy. Here at Mark Latham's Outsiders, uh, we're no fan of Alan Joyce, the head of Qantas, who's been pushing his same-sex marriage agenda. It led to the pie facing that we've covered extensively. Even I copped a bit of cream in the face over it in a related way. And um, we've had the uh, demonisation of Margaret Court who came out the tennis great from Western Australia said she wouldn't fly Qantas anymore because of Alan Joyce and his campaign. And Margaret Court has uh, been uh, ridiculed by many. This is how she was treated on the project on Channel 10. Uh, the lady with the purple hair I believe is called Michel Laurie. Let's have a look at her talking to Margaret Court. And I think anything that Christians or non-Christians say about marriage at the moment, they are being bullied and they're being intimidated. And I think people, we do have a view, we're not being allowed to say why we really believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. And I have nothing against homosexual people. They can lead their life, but don't touch marriage. And Margaret, it's if I could just interrupt and it's very there. precious. Yep, yep, yep. I get all that. Um, <laughs> but Margaret, how how do you think it I feels? Don't, I, do, I don't think I don't think that is funny. You see. And, no, I don't uh, think you and you I agree on a lot of things, it. including what's funny. But yeah, um, I know. Also, I know. I mean, do you understand how hurtful it is for LGBTQI Australians when someone of your stature sort of actively promotes the idea that they're not equal to you, that you're better than them they, and deserve they can more. Lead, they can lead. I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with you on that. I'm not saying I'm better than them. But you deserve marriage and they don't, is what you're saying. Between a man and... Well, it is, because it's in the Bible. And uh, my values, even as a little girl and being brought up, was that marriage was between a man and a woman. And Caleb, how do you view it? I think um, the whole Margaret Court situation has been blown out of proportion. You know, she said she wanted to have a boycott. So what? That, that is her right. In a free market of ideas and services, if you don't like something, you can boycott it. That's fine. But what it indicates is the sort of bullying uh, that you're getting from the, uh, the LGBTIQ, I think it is now, um, community on these topics where it's sort of if you don't agree with same-sex marriage, and, and I'll come out now and say that I don't have a problem with same-sex mm -hmm. marriage, but those who do have a problem with it are sort of being beaten into submission. Now, if you want to bring them along to your argument, I don't think you condemn them and, and you don't carry on like they're misfits. You've got to convince them of your argument. And, and this sort of carry-on that you get on the project there and the sort of reaction to Margaret Court that we've seen in the last week or two is just indicative of bullying. Mm. Kaiser? Well, look, I believe that marriage is a religious institution. It's governed by the religious books that exist. And uh, I agree with Margaret Court. It's meant to be between a man and a woman. Uh, I, again, I uh, am not interfering with the rights of uh, people from the LGBTIQ. WTF, yep. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm not interfering with their right to do what they like. But uh, again, as a religious person, I reach out to people. If I believe that people are doing something that is not in their best interest, I will give, uh, I will give them my opinion. Now, as, I know as this an, is very yeah, unpopular. Yeah, well, it's unfashionable in some quarters. Um, I admire your stance. But uh, as an Islamic scholar, under the Quran, is homosexuality a sin? Look, I'm not a scholar. Uh, I'm well, just, you've written extensively uh, I have about written extensively. I'm not a scholar, but uh, in, in my mind, the scholar has to be far more learned. And I don't believe we have anybody of that stature in Australia at the moment. Oh. Uh, uh, but um, uh, oh, yes, of course, homosexuality is uh, uh, against the Islamic teachings. It's a sin. It's a sin. Uh, it's, a sin. Uh, it's a sin. It's a sin. It's a it's seen as as a big sin in the Islamic teachings. Well, uh, on the project there, one of those. Um, uh, basically arguing with Margaret Court was Waleed Ali. So do you think he's a hypocrite then for uh, Look, I, failing I, to declare his own view as a, as a practicing Muslim on homosexuality? He seemed to be pro-same-sex marriage. How can you have it both ways? Look, uh, for me, a practicing Muslim uh, means a Muslim who uh, lives according to the teachings of the Quran. And uh, those teachings say that any uh, homosexual act Oh, sorry, I should paraphrase that. I don't know how far I can explain. Uh, yeah, go this. for it. But uh, acts of sodomy, for example, they are against religious teachings. Uh, uh, for males to, even males, same gender, to, to strip naked and be in the, each other's vicinity whilst they're naked, unless one of them is a doctor and the other one is a patient, that is against our religious teachings. So according to his religious teachings, Waleed Ali would be an opponent of same-sex marriage? Well, the religious teachings would, of course. Of yeah. course, there are religious teachings. Uh, uh, so he looks like a hypocrite on the project, uh, well, doesn't he? There he's sort of uh, uh, smirking and haranguing Margaret Court as much as uh, the pink-haired lady. Look, so uh, uh, yeah. it's a bit of cant and hypocrisy, surely. I, I can't speak about him. Uh, I, um, I, I'm not the, the person to condemn another human being as a, as a hypocrite or otherwise. Uh, I know I have my own faults and... Uh, uh, Speaking strictly as a religious person, I cannot say another person is a hypocrite or a non-believer or anything of that nature. All I can say is that the Islamic teachings uh, condemn um, homosexual practices and uh, uh, that whilst I do respect the rights of people in a multicultural society uh, such as Australia in a democratic society to live as they choose as long as they're not hurting anybody else, uh, I still... Uh, stand by what my religious teachings say and I explain yeah. them exactly as they are. Well, fellas, thanks for coming on. We're up against the clock here at Mark Latham's Outsiders. I want to thank Kaiser and Caleb for their contribution. It's been a fascinating discussion, but uh, someone else chipping in is our resident cartoonist, Zeg, who's got an interpretation on the Margaret Court controversy. Zeg is saying that uh, um, on Sky News there was someone called Stacey Lee who actually described Margaret Court as likely senile for not supporting gay marriage. Now that's way over the top. She's a tennis great and I think she's been very articulate and clear-headed in putting her position. So that's Zeg's view on that slur uh, against Margaret Court. And he's got a second cartoon for us relating to the um, uh, foreign fighters, ISIS foreign fighters coming back in to Australia where the announcement's being made there. I assume that's Virginia Trioli on the right uh, with her uh, big smile on ABC breakfast news, interrupting the, the distressing news about the foreign fighters to bring in a pussycat, ABC tri trivia, uh, trying to overwhelm the uh, concerning development about I ISIS foreign fighters coming back to Australia. So we thank Zeg for his uh, cartoon genius. He's uh, doing a great job for us. I thank our two panellists. And after this uh, little clip, we're going to come back with Bettina Arndt to talk about the men's conference on the Gold Coast and her very special uh, episode of Mark Latham's Outsiders next Tuesday with Karen Strawn right here in this studio. And we're going to play a clip of uh, Naomi Wolf being done over by Karen Strawn in an important public debate in the United States. And then we'll come back with Bettina. Stay with us for that. I, I don't think that's, that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen because, uh, you know, if you, look at, if you look at the National Organization for Women and their extended long, long history of advocacy against shared parenting legislation. Shared parenting be, being a... What's their position now today? Uh, their position now today is they still oppose it. They oppose shared parenting? They oppose a rebuttable, any legislation that it would impose a rebuttable presumption of shared parenting. Right? Any kind of... Is shared legislated parenting what it sounds like? Legislate... Mm? Shared parenting after divorce would be you know, 50-50, 60-40 custody okay, just time, right? Sure. You know, 
Um, Are you sure that's not in the case of the, the guy being abusive? Uh, or no. Violent? What they're what they're saying is they will not support any legislation that would would make the starting point in a divorce be that if neither parent is unfit and both parents want it, shared parenting is the starting point. I mean, I have to they, see that citation because that does not sound right uh, to me. I have citations. You just have just to email it to me. Yeah, I will. <laughs> okay. Karen Strawn was on the left there in the black top. It's uh, very exciting that she'll be part of Mark Latham's Outsiders next Tuesday at 8 p.m. live Facebook streaming. And excited to have Bet Bettina Rahn here. Thanks yes, very thank much. You. Tell us about your friend Karen Strawn and how important she is in the men's movement and what you describe as the phenomenon of the honey badger. Yeah, well, Karen, I heard, first heard about Karen, I don't know, about five years ago. And she was then a, wait a divorced mother with three children. And she started writing amazing stories. She started writing about the experience of going through her divorce and not wanting to be nasty to her husband, essentially, but having everybody saying, oh, you could do this and do that, T telling her, her lawyers, everybody telling her how to demolish this man. And she then wrote a blog about this, about what are we doing when people are so angry and going through the hurt of divorce to give women these incredible weapons to destroy their ex-partners mm -hmm. is so unfair. Anyway, she wrote this amazing blog and I contacted her. We had a mm -hmm. bit of a conversation and she went on and started, she put on uh, videos. Her first video, which is about the disposable man, has been seen by one and a half million people. Just massive. Wow. And she's the best known woman, I think, in the men's movement. And she started this fantastic organisation called the Honey Badgers. Mm -hmm. uh, Honey Badger, as we'll see it later. Yeah, we've got a video clip video that, yeah, about the Honey Badger. Tough animals, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be <laughs> one of the most ferocious animals in the world. They, you know, rips off heads off cobras and, you know, amazingly vicious animal. And they, she and some of her friends decided if they were going to defend men and have a go at the feminist grip on our society, they had to be tough and they had to really take them on. And that's what they've been doing. They've got their honey, honey Badger radio. Uh -huh. They're out there blogging and arguing and going on panels. She, and Karen is the, the leader of the pack in a sense. And you've got a Q&A format for next uh, Tuesday. You're Coming on the viewers here. To send yeah. in their yeah. questions uh, so to our Facebook We've already page. got some questions to come right. in, which uh -huh. is fantastic. Uh, so please send in your questions. I, uh, we, we already saw on Facebook this week that a lot of people knew who Karen was and mm -hmm. we're very pleased that she's coming on. Uh, so we want you, this is your chance to talk to Karen, to ask her your questions. You can send us your video questions or just write them down or on the night actually put questions on the Facebook page. Uh, let me guess, she hasn't got a great um, promotion off the ABC. I have been working, I've just been working my butt off for the last few weeks right. trying to organise not only for, for Karen but for Cassie J, the, mm -hmm. the filmmaker who made yeah. the red pill. Uh, they're both coming to Sydney and we I mean, organised a lot of publicity for them. Um, and um, the, per the one organisation, you guessed it, who said no again and again and again was the ABC. Right. I've got hardly any interest from the ABC. Oh, we're terribly busy in three weeks' time, they say. Oh, you know, we find it far too hard to do a pro too complex a problem to discuss on radio. I mean, just extraordinary. Mm. So anyway, you're going to fill the gap. That's what alternative media is all about. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. It's all about the opportunity to hear from important people yep. like Karen Strawn who are being ignored by the public broadcaster in Australia. Tell us about the men's conference. How's it shaping up oh, for the Oh, fantastic. Coast? Yeah, I know. It's very exciting. Lots of people coming, more people every day. We've got, and we've got a lot of international speakers who are going to, I think, total f breath of fresh air for Australia, presenting views on men's issues that just never get heard in Australia. So I hope, and I'm really pleased, I have got a lot of media coming up there mm -hmm. uh, to report on it. Which this is, is the 9th to the 11th of 9th to the 11th of June, the and we, there's still room for people to come along. And it's not just men, it's, 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 it's got, honey badger women. But women everywhere. I mean, look, right. the women who've been hosting my red pill mm -hmm. screenings all over Australia, most of them actually have been women, where the big screenings have been put on by women, which has been like Daisy Cousins, Daisy who, Cousins. You've, who you've had here. She's, she's got one coming up soon after the... Um, um, the conference is over, Renee, all sorts of women, who, many of whom had an involvement with men's issues beforehand, who've realised what's happening to men and wanted to get on board. And of course, this, the red pill 
really demonstrate some of the issues. Are we impacting. making progress there in the screenings? The censorship has ended? Oh, and well, not ended, not ended, no. but there's still... I mean, but I, I was up at VOCA on the Central Coast and we had 220 people crammed in there and people, men and women of all different ages, many of whom had, had really had no idea about what's happening to men in Australia. And applause at the end. A lot of people are really amazed to, to be shown a different view. Yeah, I think people would be amazed that uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a movie that doesn't deserve censorship. It's a regular discussion one view against another that you'd hear in a coffee shop or a, a pub or a cafe anywhere in Australia. I mean, some of the well, that we should views have, about yeah. their yeah. level of disadvantage, the uh, sociologists, the left-wing sociologists in the universities put their view. It's just a regular discussion and a sad commentary that so many people in Australia want to close down a uh, documentary yep. that is actually instructive. And, I mean, but the, the point is that the views that are expressed in that movie and the views that you hear in the pub are not the views we hear in our media, for instance. Mm -hmm. True. And I True. saw this classic example of that yesterday in an announcement on the ABC News about, male, about suicide. Mm -hmm. And the thing they emphasised was that the highest risk of suicide, group at highest risk of suicide now are men over 85. And they picked out various other things in the study, including a graph, a fascinating graph. I think we, we can show that. Yeah, we can I bring think we've got that. that. Um, because what, yeah, yeah right there it is, now look at this, it the, yeah. it the blue lines are men mm -hmm. and the red lines are women and that shows every age group from whatever it is, 15 to 85 and in every age group male suicide is far exceeding female suicide. Eight suicides a day in Australia, six of them are male and that's what that graph shows and we have this typical abc news report which reports on everything else except this blindingly obvious fact no mention of no the mention crisis of the, in male suicide no not at all they mentioned these older men which is a, yeah. which is an important issue yeah. men, older older men but the headline should have been for every age category male suicide that's is right a much bigger and they never mentioned that i've been beating the door down on our national suicide prevention people saying, why aren't you addressing male suicide for about 20 years? And they're really resistant to that. There's no research going on as to why men are committing suicide. It's just not happening. They don't want to see it. They, look, I mean, it's the most extraordinary yeah, thing, that. Yeah, and and how in the hell can the ABC look at that graph and ignore that? And that's the sort of that. issue you'll be discussing. And that's with what Karen we're talking Storm, about. ATM yeah. next Domestic uh, violence, all these issues where we only see one side of the story. And previewing the And a feminist well. side, a feminist right. ideology which has totally captured the whole cultural di dialogue in Australia. Well, and you've won me over. I love the honey badger idea. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, Karen sounds fantastic. I, I look forward to meeting And we her. want lots of questions. You can send them in this Tuesday. week. Yep, send them in. All the questions. Q&A here at Mark Latham's Outsiders. Forget about Tony Jones and the loaded panel and loaded... Uh, well, we, we tried to get we tried to get her on, yeah. on yeah, Q&A. Well, and then they do it. She's not their sort of person, but she is here at Mark Latham's Outsiders because she's addressing the, the truth, as is... Bettina, I want to thank you, Bettina, for your Pleasure. contribution on our website and all the articles you. you're putting thank up you. on Facebook. And I want to say that Which Karen is also speaking at the Sydney Institute. If, right. people, if people would like to come along to that, you have to send me an email and let me know. That's next Wednesday. Okay, well, mm. we're out of time. Thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. And in honour of the Honey Badgers, the wonderful women, let's have a look at the video that shows what they get up to at night. The Honey Badgers. We'll see you next Wednesday. And Bettina will see you next Tuesday for her special Q&A with Karen Strawn. Don't miss it. This is the honey badger. Watch it run in slow motion. It's pretty badass. Look, it runs all over the place. Whoa, watch out, says that bird. Ew, it's got a snake. Oh, it's chasing a jackal. Oh, my gosh. Oh, the honey badgers are just crazy. The honey badger has been referred to by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most fearless animal in all of the animal kingdom. It really doesn't give a shit. If it's hungry, it's hungry. Ew, what's that in its mouth? Oh, it's got a cobra? Oh, it runs backwards? Now watch this. Look, a snake's up in the tree. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. Whenever it's hungry, it just, ew, and it eats snakes? Oh my god, watch it dig. Look at that digging. The honey badger is really pretty badass. They have no regard for any other animal whatsoever. Look, and it's just grunting and, ew, eating snakes. Ew, what's that, a mouse? Oh, that's nasty. Oh, they're so nasty. Ooh, look, it's chasing things and eating them. The honey badgers 
have a fairly long body, but a distinctly thick set, broad shoulders, and, you know, their, their skin is loose, allowing them to move about freely, and they twist around. Now look, here's a house full of bees. You think the honey badger cares? It doesn't give a shit. It goes right into the house of bees to get some larvae. How disgusting is that? It eats larvae. Ew, that's so nasty. But look, the honey badger doesn't care. It's getting stung like a thousand times. It doesn't give a shit. It just, it's hungry. It doesn't care about being stung by bees. Nothing can stop the honey badger when it's hungry. Oh, what a crazy fuck. Look. Ew, it's eating larvae. That's disgusting. There it is, running in slow motion again. See? Now, what's interesting is that other, other animals, like these birds here, they just like to wait around until the honey badger's done eating, and then it swoops in to pick up the scraps. It says, you do all the work for us, honey badger, and we'll just eat whatever you find. How's that? What do you say, stupid? Look at this bird. Thanks for the treat, stupid. Hey, come back here, says the honey badger. Birds don't care. And you know what? The jackals do it, too. Look at these little dogs. They're like, thanks, stupid. Thanks for the mouse. See you later. The honey badger does all the work while these other animals just pick up the scraps. At nighttime, the honey badger goes hunting because it's hungry. Look, here comes a fierce battle between a king cobra and a honey badger. I wonder what'll happen. Look at this. There's the honey badger just eating a mouse. And then look, get away from me, says the snake. Get away from me. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger smacks the shit out of it. And the snake comes back and it lashes right at the honey badger. Oh, little does the honey badger know, FYI, it's been stung. It's been bitten by the snake. So while it's eating the snake, ew, that's disgusting. Meanwhile, the poisonous venom is seeping through the honey badger's body and it passes out. Look at that sleepy fuck. Now the honey badger is just gonna pass out for a few minutes and then it's gonna get right back up and start eating all over again because it's a hungry little bastard. Look at this, like nothing happened. The honey badger gets right back up and continues eating the cobra. How disgusting. And of course, what does the honey badger have to eat for the next three weeks? Cobra, the honey badger.